Welcome to Do It For The Gram and Enneagram podcast with your host, certified Enneagram coach, Milton Stewart, where we do it for the Enneagram, not Instagram. We make moves to improve our lives and those in our community. This is also an amazing episode. We're going to be wrapping up the defense mechanisms uh, that we kind of started with, with our three-part beginning series. We didn't know it was going to go that long, but we started riffing on the Enneagram and it was absolutely amazing. So I do have Elizabeth Worm back in the building. I'm so excited that you're here, Elizabeth. Say hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me again. We are back going deep into talking about not only defense mechanisms, but this episode, we're really going to hit, we're going to hit shame. We're going to talk about boundaries. We're going to talk about the healing messages and actually being able to move past these things to start to do real work in the world, that outer work we're talking about, that anti-racism work, that work we need to do that's outside of that and intersectionality, like all of that. We're hitting that today, okay? So I'm super excited to be here. We're finna get it. Here we go. Let's go intro music. super excited to announce my new partnership with BetterHelp. This episode is actually sponsored by BetterHelp. If you are struggling, BetterHelp can help. You'll receive 10% off their first month when you sign on using betterhelp.com forward slash do it. So I'm super excited uh, about this partnership that me and BetterHelp have um, entered into because in this point where everything that we're doing right now to connect with people is more virtual, it is so important mental health. I think that aligns perfectly with things that we're trying to do, things that I want to do, and um, anybody that I would refer or think that could be potentially beneficial to the audience. And I think BetterHelp is definitely one of them. BetterHelp is basically, it's online counseling or therapy. So you're able to actually get some counseling or therapy Uh, depending on what's going on from licensed counselors and therapists around the country. And um, you get to be able to get some of that one-on-one mental checkup that you may need and BetterHelp's able to help you. So just go to betterhelp.com forward slash do it and you'll get a 10% discount for your first month. And we are back. All right, Elizabeth. So we're going to start with how the different sets of threes of types, also known as like the Hornavian triads, how they actually disconnect when they're dealing with shame. Because I know some types would be like, I don't really feel shame. I don't do shame. But like, can you kind of explain how these different sets of threes within the Enneagram, they actually disconnect from actually trying to deal with shame? Yeah. So when we feel that not enoughness feeling, when we feel that too muchness feeling, Mm. when we feel that who do you think you are feeling, that's one way that you can be feeling shame are those things, those those voices. That's a great. Can you say that one more time? Because that, I think, encapsulates shame in such a way that we don't usually think of it. Yeah, yeah. So that not enoughness or that too muchness or who do you think you are? So those are three ways that we might think just think it's our inner critic or the, the voice that keeps us grounded but it's really a voice that's it's attacking our identity and saying that we're not worthy of love, connection, and belonging. And Brene Brown would say that we all are. <laughs> <laughs> that we are worthy of love, connection, and belonging um, just because we're human. So shame is different than guilt. We talked about in the last episode. So shame is this feeling of not enoughness um, around your identity, that I as myself am not enough or that I am too much or that there's something irredeemably flawed with my identity um, as opposed to my behavior, which can at times be problematic or harmful. And so when dealing with anti-racism work, we have to have a solid platform of self-worth so that when our behavior is being called into question, when, we're, when we need to be accountable for problematic behavior, our identity is safe and secure. And the shame whispers around our identity don't pull us out of commission for as long as it usually does. 
So if you have heard of the Hornavian triads, also sometimes called the stances, mm-hmm. um, this is basically what your repressed center is. So for example, threes, sevens, and eights are all aggressive numbers. You can call them um, (laughs) go-getters. Basically, (laughs) they are the numbers that really believe that they can shape the world to be according to how they want. They believe that they can, they dream up something and they can go get it. They can make it happen in the world. And they have the energy to do that. They have the most energy of the Enneagram. So three, sevens, and eights, all use the feeling center as the least productive center when they're kind of in that autopilot average space. So, you know, I I would call that feeling repressed. It doesn't mean they don't have feelings. It means they don't use their feeling center for what it's designed to use until they put in some work and some practice. So one thing that aggressive numbers will do, if you've heard of the fight or flight uh, defense mechanism, we're going to be talking about fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. Mm -hmm. So we're adding a couple extra ones here. I've noticed some patterns with aggressive numbers. They want to stand against. They move against. They want to stand independently in the world. They don't want to have anyone else in control of their own time, energy. They just want to have autonomy over their own fate. So when aggressive numbers are dealing with shame, when shame starts to tell them that they're not good enough or that they can't be who they need to be, they move into fight. They stand again, and they can use that to gain power over others. So what that might look like, for example, like eight, you might cut off a relationship after a betrayal. You know, you could look at that as a flight too, but it could be a fight. You could stand against and be like, and really challenge that relationship. Call somebody out for being against you or, you know, like it's my way or the highway. For threes, again, kind of just that that challenging, that fighting, you could look, I mean, they could be flighting too, um, in terms of burying themselves in their work, trying to avoid, mm-hmm. <laughs> trying to avoid um, feelings, avoid shame and bury themselves in their work or exercise, like really just like, I'm going to like have this, this workout that just really wants to make, makes me want to throw up. It's so intense. Like, yes, yeah. you know, and there might be some feelings that you're trying to avoid their sevens can become kind of obstinate or stubborn or defensive in order to deflect the pain or hard emotions. Well, I mean, when you talk about going against, you know, I I think of it in the way of we all know kind of tend to break rules. Threes determine if it's worth following and sevens, if it doesn't kind of go with the way that they want things to go, they'll find a way to bend it. They'll find a loophole. They were like, well, you didn't say I couldn't do that. And as I look back in my life, I did that quite a bit. But naturally, I did not see what was wrong with it because in my mind, it was right. Like there was a natural instinct to be like, you didn't say I couldn't go and do this. You said I couldn't do that. And I did this. So why am I in trouble? So I've had that issue multiple times in my life for sure. But I think it's definitely something that I would say the assertive types or aggressive types uh, in the Hornavian triangle really tend to go for like that gain for power. And it's against people. It's against rules. It's against it's it's trying to gain power somehow to go against someone to try to get what they want in order to avoid the shame of what like that feeling is. And these types, too, if you look at them, it's a little different for each one. They can all feel like they're too much you know, Mm -hmm. to a certain Mm -hmm. extent. But then also they can feel like they're not enough or they're like, you know, not feel just like, oh. And so there is a a lot of shame in those aspects. And these numbers, me being one of the emotionally uh, repressed. And like you said before, it doesn't mean you don't have emotions. It's far from that. But it's like, we don't always use our emotions in the healthiest way and on the Mm -hmm. healthiest side and actually Mm -hmm. process and work through them, the more Mm -hmm. tender ones. So when you think about that, when it comes to going against and across people, we tend to cut out the part of the heart of thinking about the situation when we're trying to get something or avoid shame. We tend to cut that part out. It's like, I got to get what I have to get and I have to keep moving forward. It's a survival. So much. And what's so interesting, it's kind of, even though we do, it's it's almost, it's a little unconscious and and subtle at the same time, I think. Mm -hmm. There's things we, and elements of it that we don't fully realize or understand or we attribute to, that's just a part of who I am. And it's like, "Mm, no, that's a part of the shame of like what you're yeah. avoiding your essence, you know? So yeah. yeah, that's a good point. The emotion part of it. Ooh, yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and these, I would say specifically, we're talking about strategies of disconnection when dealing with shame. I mean, these fight, flight, freeze response can come into play during all sorts of things that you, you know, that yes. you need, when you need to survive. Yes. We were discussing this before the episode started. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, literally, if you're being chased by a tiger, like it's a, it's probably a good thing to go into fight or fight or freeze or fight. I would say flight. That's personally, I would say <laughs> probably you need to flee that situation. I mean, you know, like we've talked about before, the ego is not good or bad. Its role is to protect you, to get your needs met, to help you survive. It's a survival mechanism. So it's not necessarily bad that it's coming out. We just need to be aware of it. And like we talked about before, if you are in the driver's seat of your own car, your ego can be right in the passenger seat and you can be like, thank you so much, ego, for giving me this warning that this is coming up, but I'm in control as opposed to letting ego drive the car and avoiding everything that looks vulnerable. Yeah. Ego don't have a license. Uh, no registration paper. It's just driving all over the road, not following none of the rules of the road. So yeah, we do have to be careful not to let our egos drive our cars, please. All right, so tell us about the strategy of disconnection for withdrawing types, at least the primary. Yeah, at least the primary. Because I do think we we talked about earlier that um, every number probably uses any of these types at some point throughout their life. However, my hypothesis is that there's a primary strategy of disconnection, especially when dealing with shame. So withdrawing numbers will move away. These are four, fives, and nines. So they are the numbers that the doing center is the least productive center. So they get stuck in feeling and thinking, and they have a hard time acting productively on it. They might do other things. They might be really good at procrastinating, <laughs> um, but they don't do the thing that needs to be done at the time that it needs to be done. So when we talk about being doing repressed, that's what we mean. And so they use flight to hide or silence the shame voices. And so, you know, the withdrawing stance is oriented inward. If the aggressive stance is kind of oriented against or mm-hmm. independently, the withdrawing stance or triangle is oriented inward. Their identity actually comes from within and they're able to meet their own needs internally. So they can withdraw to get time alone to be able to sort through their thoughts and their feelings. They are not dependent on external people to help them with like the uh, ones, twos, and sixes are like we'll talk about in a second. So their strategies could look like, um, you know, like nines, um, they could be unwilling to engage in conflict when conflict comes and they just kind of withdraw, they check out, they don't, they're not actively engaged. Again, to kind of preserve that homeostasis of inner peace, their inner sanctum. <laughs> I think nines have kind of this yes. inner sanctum where they kind of go to check out. You Even during a conversation, if it's getting like a hard conversation, they have the ability to kind of just um, nod and and look polite and and you think they're agreeing with you and then um, actually they're checking out in their inner sanctum because they are tired. <laughs> and so when they're dealing with shame, I think shame is a feeling that disrupts that homeostasis. And so they're going to try to fall asleep to that. Shame in itself is disintegrating. It makes you want to turn away. Um, and so makes you even want to turn away from those places in your own self. And nines are going to fall, they're going to turn away. They're going to disintegrate, fall asleep to those uncomfortable feelings within themselves. Can leave or withdraw from relationships for fear of being hurt or misunderstood. So they, for as I say, probably struggle with shame the most viscerally, like from at least from conversations I've had with people, like they seem to be the most aware of their feelings on the surface at least. And, um, and a lot of times I hear that fours are really, they feel ashamed when they're the last to find out. Someone thinks that they did something wrong and they didn't know about it and they feel like a fool. And so then instead of engaging and, you know, getting some constructive criticism, like they are going to retreat because their shame voice is paralyzing them. Um, telling them how stupid they are or how foolish they are or why didn't they didn't know that, you know, type of type of thing. And they can just yeah. go into the, the basement thing spiral. <laughs> and then fives also withdraw when dealing with shame. And it can look like it can look like, you know, going down a rabbit hole of research. Um, <laughs> it can look like isolating 
you know, especially like we talked about fives still sometimes feel their feelings, but they want to feel them in private. They want to isolate themselves. And so they're going to use that hoarding time, space, energy, and privacy. Um, When shame shows up, they're probably going to leave the conversation. And then if they're going to try to distract themselves with that, they'll probably try to distract themselves with something that engages their thinking center, which is their dominant center. I don't know. What are your thoughts on four, fives, and nines? I definitely, definitely, definitely agree with what you said. And the four, fives, and nines, if you really pay attention to those, they have such a vast inner world. We all have inner worlds, obviously, but like they have a vast inner world. What's going on inside of them is like way more complex than what's going on outside of them to a certain extent. It's like more intricate, I guess I would say. Mm -hmm. Like they, they all have these really interesting, complex inner worlds that they go to. That helps them to withdraw in order to avoid shame, just like you said. So it's it's really interesting. They have to be careful and notice if they're going in for like, you know, to do some work, to really observe, to sit with, to honor, to express, or are they going in to avoid and withdraw yeah. because yeah. of something? And then I always think about the fours. So and so interestingly enough, when we talk about one thing I know that fours feel shame for, especially sexual fours, mm-hmm. is that when they get frustrated and they express exactly maybe momentarily how they feel emotionally to somebody. And it comes across because usually comes across with anger. It comes across. And then after that, they feel extremely shameful because Mm. it's like, I did not want them to feel that way. It's not like I didn't mean to say that, but I didn't mean to say it that way, you know, Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. there was more to it that I wanted to get across. And I feel like I, I, I hurt somebody or I burned a bridge or something. So I know that's also creates quite a bit of shame for sexual fours, especially just like you said, nines and fives definitely going inside when we talk about shame. Oh my goodness. Like these types, especially I would say a five and a nine, they could be to a, a space, especially the five where they don't even process shame really. It's like, mm. I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. Shame. Mm. I, don't, I don't know how that feels. And I know that because I have, my mom's a five and mm-hmm. they were doing a lesson like at her church on shame. And she was like, she literally asked, she's like, what is shame? And she was mm-hmm. like, have I ever Felt, I was like, you're self prayer is five. It's highly unlikely that you physically felt it. And, but when you when there's a chance to feel it, like you said, we have these ways to disconnect from it. Right. So I, I'm sleep. just going to, yeah, I'm just going to withdraw. And then I'm going to yeah. go in my head. And then I'm just going to process a whole bunch of different things. And then yeah. I don't have to feel it. I'm good. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I was, I was literally talking to a five at work about um, Brene Brown's work and how she's a shame researcher. And this five was like, well... I don't think everybody, you know, feels shame. So, you know, we don't want to assume that about everyone. And um, I was in the meeting with someone who literally is a dare to lead facilitator who was trained by Brene in the, in the research. And we were talking together and, and the facilitator was like, well, actually Brene's research is about 20 years on, on shame. And, and her data says that everyone does feel shame unless they're a sociopath. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then the five was like, well, I, you know, I just don't want to alienate people if we're talking about the word shame. We'd rather focus on empathy. And the facilitator picked off on that and kind of read read her, her, this is literally happening in real time. You know, this five is literally wanting to avoid talking about shame. And she was like, yeah, I mean, it's part of emotional intelligence. And then the five was like, oh, we're all about emotional intelligence here. All about emotional intelligence. And it was just, I I was just like amazed at watching, like literally we're talking about Brene Brown's work and how shame shows up and she couldn't even engage in that conversation. And we couldn't, we couldn't even get to the point of talking about why empathy is the antidote to shame, like why empathy is important Mm -hmm. and you can't get to empathy until you deal with the own shame that you're feeling. Otherwise you can't relate. You can't put yourself in other people's shoes in the same meaningful way. So it is um, yeah. so sneaky. It was yes. underneath the surface. I personally think that the way shame works is a lot like how racism works. Racism Ooh. works underneath the surface. And when you call it out, it evolves. And it's like this little snake. You can't see me right now, but I'm like moving like a snake. It <laughs> evolves and it moves like a little snake and you want to call it. And then it's like, oh, no, that's not my name. And then it changes and shifts and finds a different way to resist and show up. So racism continues to exist because it we we keep not calling it out. And shame continues to exist because we keep not calling it out. 
And so we have to call it out and bring it into the light because that's where the work can finally be done. Yes. Speak on it. Oh, I love that. That is that is so true. I was about to chime in and say that like you can't skip the process. You you yeah. can't skip to like, oh, it's going to work because we're going to talk about this end result and goal. Like we're going to get here. You have to go through. It. It's a journey. The work is real and you have to do it in order to grow, in order to fix, in order to transform any process, any system, any person, yourself, all that. You have to go through the process of actually going through these different parts of us that exist and not trying to jump to like, oh, and that's coming from a seven, right? And like, oh, mm-hmm. this is going to be this good part. Let's do this. We cannot do that. It, mm-hmm. it, it doesn't work that way. We don't truly learn, like express, honor, and deal with the stuff we need to deal with in order to get to those points. So mm-hmm. I, spot on, Elizabeth. Mm-hmm. Spot on. Subtle like racism. Let's talk about dependent numbers yeah. here. Let's, let's talk about this, this uh, last Harnavian yeah. set of threes. So these are the ones, twos, and sixes. We can call them the dependent stance. Um, what this means is that they um, are oriented towards others. They usually get their identity from outside of themselves, and therefore they're dependent on others for their identity. They believe they must earn the right to have their needs met. So the ones, twos, and sixes, they are the thinking repressed, um, which means doesn't mean they don't think. Usually it means that they over. <laughs> They do not use their thinking center productively. And I'm part of this triad, so I can say that. Two is you think, but you don't necessarily mean, it doesn't mean you're thinking productively. Overanalyzing, overthinking, overplanning, thinking too much about relationships or overobsessing about perfection, overthinking about worst case scenarios that could happen. All of those, that's a mis- misuse of our thinking center. It's supposed to be used for uh, more productive things. So dependent numbers, uh, fun. And so what is fun? Might yes. You ask? yes, what is fun? <laughs> so fun is probably the best understood as people pleasing. So it relates to in trauma or stress, it's a response where you're accommodating others' needs. It usually shows up in codependent relationships. It's when people are seeking safety by merging with the wishes or the needs or demands of others, you almost act like unconsciously that um, the price of the the relationship means that you have to let go of any needs or rights or boundaries that you have. So some, some classic examples of what fawning is, is being able to say how you really think or feel because you're afraid it's going to rock the boat, saying yes too many times, being afraid to say no, maybe over complimenting or over flattering, um, any kind of conflict avoidance. When you realize you just feel taken advantage of, you don't feel like your needs and priorities get to be talked about. Those are examples of fawning. And so, you know, the fawn, it's really interesting because the dependent stance believes that they have to earn the right to have their needs met. Fawn types also struggle to take up space and express their needs. They're they're almost like apologetic about taking up space. And so this is from Dr. Kathy Heselman, president of the Blue Knot Foundation, which is, she works with the National Center of Excellence for Complex Trauma. She says, when we lack the power or ability to fight or flee, which occurs commonly with complex trauma, we will freeze, appease, or disassociate. So freeze is another one we haven't talked about. We're going to get to that one in a minute. But that appeasing, people pleasing, the appease response, which is also known as please or fawn, is another survival response. It occurs when survivors read danger signals and aim to comply or minimize the confrontation in an attempt to protect themselves. So that's why we call it a, a response to conflict, to trauma, to stress, and to shame. When a dep- someone in the dependent stance, so one, two, or six, feels shame, they're likely to over-apologize, you know, overdo, overextend themselves, right? So twos, doing, doing what's not yours to do. <laughs> Sixes, taking on too much extra work out of duty or loyalty and then ending up exhausted or behind. Ones, again, overworking from not being able to say no, since it just feels like there are too many right things to do. Maybe you did something wrong and you feel like you have to make up for it and you're never going to be able to make up for it. 
Um, and that shame voice is just like, you can't do anything right. You're irredeemably flawed. No one wants you. You can't trust, like, you can't trust anyone. And no one can trust you. You can't even trust yourself. So those types of things are going to show up when you're feeling shame, you know, whereas a three, seven, or eight is probably more likely to fight and challenge and, and be more um, visibly defensive. The four, five, and nine are going to withdraw and retreat. They're going to flee the situation. And the one, twos, or sixes are going to appease or fawn. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna fawn. <laughs> um, and people please. Now, you and I were talking before this about freeze. Yes. And honestly, I'm wondering if freeze kind of shows up in all of them. Mm-hmm. What do you think about that? I was looking at that too when we were talking about it. I think freeze definitely shows up with all of them when they enter a space that maybe is their repressed center, when Mm -hmm. it's overloaded. Mm -hmm. You know, I think of a family incident that was, I had an uncle being dangerous. As years ago, I was a teenager and it was dangerous around family members and he had a weapon in his hand. Mentally, I was like, I need to get that weapon out of his hand and get him like down and get it away from him. That was my thought in my mind. But because of the situation was so highly like emotionally charged. And I was thinking about the people in there and the ramifications of what could happen because he was on drugs at the time. So he's super strong. Mm -hmm. I was like, I didn't do anything. I didn't go forward. I didn't go back. Luckily, my other uncle stepped in. But what was was racing through your mind Tell, tell us a little bit more about what was racing through your mind. What was your thought process in that? Yeah, the thought process, it was, I need to disarm him. Mm-hmm. The other process was like, I'm worried about whether I will be hurt. More or less, will other people get hurt, mm-hmm. you know, in this situation? And I don't know if me alone is actually going to be able to stop this or will I make it worse, you know, mm-hmm. in this situation. So like I was in this mode where I really was kind of like in action, very in action in this situation, which is, you know, in certain situations, I'm I'm not like that typically, you know, but mm-hmm. that situation calls for that one. I know we were discussing this of so just like how freeze may show up for our repressed areas. Like I think of really sad situations that are deeply emotional. There's a lot of times I don't know what to do. And so yeah. I don't do anything. Like it's, it's it's been work for me to grow and to know like, okay, I need to maybe say something, but not like, you know, and know what to say and not necessarily say something that's like, that's not helpful. Wow. You know, yeah. or I need to just sit by them. I need to put my arm, like something like that. Like it's taken me time to learn that, but that's mm-hmm. not natural to my type. So in those moments that are deeply sad, like emotionally charged in a way that's sad, Or that's uncomfortable, not even sad. I would say uncomfortable, maybe for three, seven, and eights. There's a moment of freezing because I don't naturally really know what to do. And my primary way of dealing with the situation of fighting is not applicable in this situation or not necessarily probably going to work. So that's the one that like, I think when it comes to freeze, maybe for aggressive types, we may go to every once in a while um, in that situation. Yeah, yeah, no, and I think... That that inaction that you mentioned sometimes can look like um, disassociation too, mm-hmm. um, depending on which type you are, you know, spacing out, numbing out, feeling like you're outside of your body, that difficulty, that pair. We talked about last time, certain numbers that a barrier that might be to doing anti-racism work, right? Like we talked about fours, maybe getting paralyzed by their feelings and not knowing what to do. So they just they don't do anything or sixes being paralyzed by anxiety or nines being paralyzed by indecision. Like those are some, some examples. I mean, I think every number can probably be paralyzed by something and that anxiety can creep up. And like you said, you don't know what to do. Yeah. I get that way. When we talk about subtypes, um, my, my sequence or my stack, I'm social to um, first and foremost, and then sexual and then self is my repressed uh, <laughs> instinct. And um, when I get to a point where I'm starving and I don't know what to eat and there's nothing in my fridge, I don't know what to do when I go into this panic and I don't do anything. I just sit there being hungry for like hours. (laughs) And it's just, it's like, I don't know how to feed myself, but like normally I do, you know, like it's just kind of that, like it, that feeling of paralyzation of like, I don't know how to fix this situation. 
So when shame shows up, I think that absolutely we can, depending on what our repressed center is or in our um, move to stress, our, our move disintegration arrow with the disintegration arrow, freezing might show up there. We also might take on a different style of disconnection in our stress state. I know as a two, I go to eight and I can go to fight. Like I can be done people pleasing and then go to fight. So <laughs> I'm curious if maybe other numbers might be able to relate, you know, to you have one strategy of disconnection when you're kind of in your autopilot or um, lower core type, and then you go to your stress number and then your strategy. Oh yeah, I agree. Just thinking about, you know, when I move to the one arrow, the lower side, and fight doesn't work in certain situations, I'll become um, I'll become compliant to a, to a certain mm-hmm. extent, but it's to get what I want in the end. It's a strategy in order to get what I want that's going to end in me trying to somehow gain power over a situation. But it's still that core thing of wanting to gain power to avoid shame mm-hmm. and or to just to get what I want in the situation. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it shifts over to actually being compliant mm. for why it's like, oh, I hate this, but I'm going to do it because I think I can get what I want if I keep going. So mm. I think those arrow movements actually are like spot on, like how we can get stuck in actually fight, flight, freeze, or fun mm-hmm. uh, in these situations to deal with the complexities of shame and life. Yeah. So I typically go am a fawn responder, but then when I moved to freeze, so I used to be um, a conference planner and traveled around the U.S. And um, there was a time when one of our attendees broke her ankle playing volleyball. And so she she was also pretty drunk. So people brought her to us and my boss was a six and my coworker was a three and I'm a two. And that we've got this drunk girl who's sobbing and in a wheelchair um, <laughs> and holding a volleyball. <laughs> it's just kind of a hot mess. Wilson! <laughs> she was just like, I shouldn't have been playing volleyball. I'm the worst. Like, I mean, she was in her own little shame spiral, just blaming herself. <laughs> and so I just got your Wilson joke, by the way. And so um, I had kind of a stressful relationship with my boss. I, I didn't. I really wanted her to like me. Normally I was in that people pleasing mode. Um, But I was kind of, and normally if someone had sprained their ankle, you bet your ass, I would be all over like, are you doing okay? How can I help you? Like, just like smothering and mothering, nurturing, you know, and everything. But I was kind of trying to take the cue from my type six boss who wasn't doing anything. (laughs) And she was standing there. And so the three, she's not the type of person to really like comfort somebody. She's not like a comforting type of person. So she just went to the front desk to call 911 to get the uh, ambulance. And she kept like going to get like a water bottle or she was just like getting very practical things. And then the six, she was just like, they're there. Oh, it's okay. It'll be okay. The girl was crying and, you know, this is all my fault. She's like, oh, it's, it's okay. Like that was like the only thing she could think to say. She was not like comforting her, like phys- like I would have been physically touching her, but I was also noticing how I literally was just standing there. I literally didn't do anything in this situation wow. because I was like, my boss isn't. And so if I decide to assert myself and try to be a little bit more empathetic or, you know, sympathetic or whatever, right then maybe she would tell me that I handled that situation wrong. And so I was just doing whatever she did and she wasn't doing anything. And so I was kind of in, in an effort to please my boss, I was freezing. Mm. <laughs> wow. So finally the girl's husband came and he was much better at comforting her than any of us were doing. <laughs> the ambulance came. She was, you know, she was fine. She got to the hospital and she turned not fine. But I remember reflecting on that situation and being like, why did I freeze in that situation? And kind of like you were saying, like when you become compliant, your, your motivation is still to gain power or control and compliant is a tactic to gain power and control. And freezing for me was a tactic to people, please. I hear you. Mm, that's rich. It reminds me of a story, but I'm going to keep it to myself and we'll okay. talk about it later. <laughs> keep going. Moving on, let's let's talk about, I think something that's very important is to kind of talk about boundaries and we're just going to mm-hmm. read them off. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And we've gave some, we've already you've already given some great examples, but like mm-hmm. we're going to give the boundaries of like what's too lax and what's too firm for each type because mm-hmm. boundaries are super important. And some of us have the thickest boundaries in the world, aka fives, and then some of us have these super lax boundaries, or they don't really exist. Can be nine, sometimes twos. So we have to look at these because all of us have too lax and too firm when we go too extreme with them. Okay, mm-hmm. so how about you do the boundaries that are maybe too lax and I do the boundaries that are too firm. Does your workplace stink because the culture sucks? Are you tired of tolerating people and wish you could all work together cohesively? Does going to work give you instant anxiety? If you say yes to any one of these, you should probably quit your job. But since you aren't going to quit your job, you should call Kaizen Careers. At Kaizen Careers, we are all about improving personal and workplace performance. We use a unique tool called the Enneagram. The Enneagram helps individuals and organizations become more self-aware. That self-awareness lends into helping organizations with communication, leadership, and conflict management, ultimately turning self-awareness into self-mastery and creating healthy workplace performance so you can improve your services and bottom line. You can reach Kaizen Careers at kaizencareers.com or 901-334-1644. And just to kind of say, this relates to defense mechanisms because our boundaries can be used as defense mechanisms. You might hear some themes of that fight, flight, freeze, or fawn in some of these boundaries because our defense mechanisms are going to show up in a lot of different ways. So oh, yeah. by looking at how our boundaries are maybe too lax or too firm, that's another cue, another thing you can observe in yourself at actually how you might be getting defensive. Okay, so let's start with eight. When their boundaries are too lax, their lust for control or intensity overtakes them. They can go too hard, too fast, or too long. When eight's boundaries are too firm, they can go cutting off relationships after betrayal, dualistic thinking, insistent on their way or the highway. When nine's boundaries are too lax, they can be self-forgetting, Um, which is kind of their sloth, deadly sin, or vice, by merging with others' priorities, values, and preferences, all in order to avoid conflict. When nine's boundaries are too firm, they can stubbornly be unwilling to engage in conflict, internal and external boundaries, to keep homeostasis. Yeah. Ones, when your boundaries are too lax, uh, you can get overworked from not saying no to anything since it just seems like there are too many, quote, right things to do. Ones, when your boundaries are too firm, your passion for justice can mix with anger and boundaries of right and wrong can become too rigid. Twos, when your boundaries are too lax, you go into people pleasing, you can do what's not yours to do, and your deadly sin or vice of pride might tell you that you are the only one that can help in this situation. Twos, when those boundaries are too firm, that access to that lower eight space energy comes alive and you impulsively chop off relationships, explode or quit things. <laughs> um, threes, when your boundaries are too lax, you might be unable to quit working and put some boundaries around, you know, I'm only going to work from nine to five. You know, quit working. You can deceive yourself that you will rest when the work is done. But secret, the work is never done. Threes, when the boundaries are too firm, a lack of empathy for others in the name of efficiency and accomplishing task happens. So be careful because the efficiency of the three can override and steamroll relationships easily. Fours, um, when your boundaries are too lax, your envy, and envy, I would say, is different from jealousy. Envy, being envious is like wishing that you had qualities, that you could be a certain person. You see a person and you... You're mad at them for being who they are because you wish you could be like that. So something like that. (laughs) Um, We could do a whole podcast on just what that means, but you can become envious of others. You can see yourself as a victim, not having enough or being enough. And this happens, especially with shame. um, When you are involved in a conflict or making a mistake and you don't hold yourself accountable for your own part, and you blame the other person for being in the wrong and not yourself because you're the victim. So I would just be careful about giving both yourself and the other person the credit of being human, like humanizing both yourself and the other person and realizing that you 
are just as valuable as the other person. And also there might be work on both sides of the fence to be done. Fours, when your boundaries are too firm, you leave a withdrawal from relationships for fear of being hurt or misunderstood. Fives, when your boundaries are too lax, you might access some low seven space energy, um, becoming impulsive or spontaneous or overindulgent, like martini night, let's go, let's book a cruise. Like you're, you've isolated yourself to a point where your world has gotten so small, you have to come back with, with all sorts of uh, fun, like a fun trip to Disney World. I had a five once tell me that um, when she's stressed, she uh, goes to Disney World. <laughs> Fives, when your boundaries are too firm, you start to move into avarice and you start to hoard time, space, energy, and privacy all to yourself and not in a good way necessarily. Avarice is a deep holding on to all like your personal resources and different mm-hmm. things. It's, it's a deep holding on. It's related to fear. Mm -hmm. of letting people in and different things. So yeah, very, very, they have to really be careful Mm because it mirrors their own kind of like need to withdraw at times. Yeah. So they have to be careful. Avarice is tricky, Mm -hmm. really, really tricky. Mm -hmm. Six is when your boundaries are too lax, you might take on too much extra work out of duty, loyalty, end up exhausted and behind. You might access some of that um, low three space of doing all the work going through all the motions, but nothing is getting done. Mm -hmm. That's why a lot of sixes think they're threes until they really do some work. Oh yeah, Mm -hmm. it happens. Sixes, when your boundaries are too firm, you shut down emotionally and you withdraw out of fear, caution, and anxiety. Yeah, out of uh, distrusting. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sevens, when your boundaries are too lax, you can throw caution to the wind, willing to try anything. (laughs) This is where gluttonous behavior can come up, uh, which means that more is always better. Oh, this is so dangerous as a seven. Oh, my. What's so interesting being a self prez dominant seven Mm -hmm. is that I see the the range of when sevenness is taking over, like in that version of it, the unhealthy version, and when the self prez is taking over. So I can go from being super like, super fearful of doing something or doing and then go to all the way to the extreme to where like I'm the person leading. It's like, Mm -hmm. what? (laughs) What is going on? So yeah, sevens, when your boundaries are too firm, you become obstinate, stubborn, defensive, or deflect in order to avoid pain or hard emotions, which I've definitely done before. No doubt I have to be careful because obstinate can be real for a seven. Oh my Mm. Sevens can inject joy into a place, but they also can suck it out of a place. I'm telling you, <laughs> you have to be careful. I, I wonder, do you think sevens can look a lot like eights um, in times when they're being challenged, would you oh, say? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That. Most definitely. M- most definitely uh, can look like if you don't pay attention to that person, um, if you just saw them it just like off the bat and maybe you would look at them, you know, like you may think that person's an eight because they, like sevens, there's a rebellious nature inside of sevens. And if they're challenging, they mentally can go toe to toe with a lot of different people mm-hmm. if they if they want to go there. So you do have to be aware of that because they can look like eights, but there's a total difference inside of what's going on. And you right. feel the difference too. So there's a different feel when you're like going against different types. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like if people mm-hmm. understand, it's like, so when the seven's coming at you, like if, if a seven's coming at you, let's mm-hmm. give an example, right? Mm-hmm. You're going to feel it more in your brain. Like there's going to be a little mm-hmm. bit more head, either confusion, annoyance, uh, distraction going on in your head because they're going to be going for things in your head more like. When you get into it, like with an eight, you feel it in your body, mm-hmm. okay? When you get into it with maybe a two or four, you're going to feel it in your heart. Like, there's going to be some emotional things coming your way, even if it's not emotional words, but you're going to feel it because a lot of times it's going to be such strong energy coming from that area. You can be like, oh, ooh, you know, and that can be troubling for people who are not used to these different centers. So if you go, mm-hmm. if somebody's coming at you or you're getting arguing with somebody and they're a different type and different center of intelligence and they get really mad, you're going to feel in a different place in your body compared, uh, depending on what's their type. It's interesting. 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 Something else for me to self-observe. <laughs> oh, yes. Ooh. Oh, my. All right. So 
Let, let's look a little bit about um, and go very directly since we talked about the boundaries. Mm-hmm. Let's go into the messages that shame, like it's a wounding message that shame actually tells us type by type. Let's let's go yeah. into that. Can you can you run down kind of the shame wounding message, but then also can you pair it with the importance and the healing message of it? Because yeah. there's both in there mm-hmm. and we have to understand the importance of them. Yeah. And yeah, I definitely will. And I will say, you know, just off the cuff, the healing messages, they're not, I mean, they don't seem very (laughs) deep. (laughs) They're true. I'll tell you they're true, but it really takes some time for them to be absorbed into yourself because those wounding messages have cut so deep and there's so much scar tissue around. You can't just like slather on some lotion of a healing message and expect it to do the deep work. (laughs) Um, you, you really have to, you know, so I'm going to include some mantras that, um, I, I did a workshop on, on some of these and, um, our collective group helped me come up with some mantras for each type that helps. If you want to sit even for five minutes, breathing in the healing message and reaffirming them to yourself. And, and I definitely recommend finding people, find friend groups and people who call out the goodness and greatness and the healing message in you. Um, as opposed to reconfirming that wounding message. But you can't all be, you can't rely on everyone else to do the healing work for yourself. You have to also engage in that healing work for yourself. And so one way I've found to do that for myself is to do some mantras, do some meditation around some of these healing messages. Yeah, and let me add real quick, both of these messages, people don't understand, this is a a big part of where our type is derived from, like the message we heard. So even if you hear your, and you're like, no, I don't think that, you know, like, especially if you have an automatic reaction, then you need to be extra curious on like, why did I respond like that, you know? Mm. And I, I want you to be curious about, if you haven't heard this or noticed this in your life for your type, be curious, how does it show up? And just continuously be curious about it because just like Elizabeth said, these things, they are subtle, but they're also like deadly at the same time because they are really uh, manifesting our ego and they can really control our lives. And so Mm -hmm. if you're able to get to that, because it took me a while to realize when we get to the seven, we'll talk about that, but to realize like, I didn't know I felt that way, like deep down inside, because that's like you say, it's a whole bunch of scar tissue then covered it up and I have to get there. So go ahead. I just wanted to let yeah. them know that because this, this, yeah. this is deep stuff. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go one through nine. So one's shame's wounding message for you is that you're not good enough. Ones have an inner critic that delivers shaming self-talk all day, every day, more than all the other types do. So maybe to turn down the volume a bit on the shame voice that's telling you you're not good enough, maybe try a mantra that says, I'm a work in progress and that is enough. Or, I am already good and loved just as I am. Twos. <laughs> Your shame shows up as you're unlovable and no one wants you. And to combat that, take in the healing message of you are loved and wanted, that you are lovable just as yourself. So a mantra you can use is, I am already loved and I am already wanted. I am lovable just as myself. Threes, shame shows up as you're a failure and a fraud. So we have to combat that healing message as you are loved for yourself. So threes are chameleons. They read the room to be or do what others perceive as successful. They have the energy and stamina to shape shift and accomplish whatever is needed to succeed or provide value. Providing value is so important to threes. So when a three fails to provide value, that's when shame's voice shows up. And so uh, courage for threes includes stopping to rest and be and trust that even if they're not doing or succeeding, they're still worthy of love for who they are. So some mantras could be, I am loved for who I am, not just for what I do, or presence over performance, presence over performance, wars. <laughs> Fours spend so much of their lives feeling like a piece of them is missing and they have a strong desire to be their whole selves and true selves, but how can a four (laughs) be themselves if they don't know who they are? (laughs) Um, So a four's shame wounding message shows up as you aren't whole and no one sees you. 
So you might try a mantra um, or shame also might show up and say, you're too much and not enough. Healing will come with the message that you don't need to be anyone else to matter, that you can just be your own lovable self. So you might try a mantra that is, there is room for me to be myself. And you can also try, I can be me without even trying. Fives. So fives um, have a sort of scarcity mindset um, that there isn't enough and they have to hang on to what they have. They also have internalized the message that it's not okay to hope in themselves that they're not capable. Hurley and Dobson said that they are plagued with memories of being shunned or seen as offensive for saying something with the intention of being helpful that others perceived as insensitive or rigid or superior. And so because fives expect abandonment, they uh, find comfort in their own private thinking world. So fives, the message that you might hear is you're a problem and in the way. And so to combat that, you could say, I am accepted and nurtured. A healing mantra could be, I can take this one day at a time. Or to combat that scarcity mindset, try a mindset of abundance of what if there is enough? What if there is enough? Sixes. Um, sixes have internalized the message that it's not okay to trust themselves. So shame shows up and says, six, you're wrong. Who do you think you are? Because they don't trust themselves, they find security and safety in groups, uh, systems, processes, externalized somehow. So the healing message for six is that you can trust yourself. Um, you might try a mantra while breathing in, you are safe and you are supported. You might find helpful mantra to be uh, choosing courage means I can trust myself. Sixes do things all the time that scare them. <laughs> um, they, they do that on a daily basis. One thing that courage is for sixes is learning how to trust themselves. That's something that they can work on. So we, when we combat Shane's whispers by leaning into this divine love and our healing messages, we allow unhelpful personality patterns to fall away, which leads to freedom and transformation. That's kind of where we're, we're heading with these. All right, so moving on to sevens. So sevens have this fear of being deprived and in pain that their needs are never going to be satisfied or fulfilled. Um, their deep wound comes from the pain of emotional alienation. And so they compensate by a life of positivity and pleasure seeking and creative intellectual stimulation. Um, so sevens, the message that shame might tell you is you're too much to take care of. So you need to go take care of your own self. <laughs> and um, so healing messages for sevens is you will be taken care of or you will be provided for. And um, seven, some mantras for you. I can make room to let love and light in. Sevens also mantra could be I can do hard things. I personally do love you will be provided for. I use that all the time for myself, but sevens, that might be helpful, helpful for you. The promise of nurturing and acceptance can give you the strength to persevere through the hard seasons of life. Eights. Shame shows up for eights as you're weak and you're powerless. Eights minimize their emotional needs and maximize their power to control their own lives because somewhere early on in their childhood, they experienced some form of betrayal, a vulnerability that was exploited or an emotional need that was dismissed, which they in turn internalized as weakness within themselves. So that's why they, when feeling weak or vulnerable, shame shows up and says, you're not worth anything. And so eighth healing message for you, your vulnerability is beautiful. It's not a weakness. So a mantra for you could be surrender isn't giving up, it's letting go. To see and be seen is the truest nature of love. So um, I think that one's from Morgan Harper Nichols. Um, she has a meditation called quiet strength is still strength. Vulnerability, as Brene Brown would say, is it leads to intimacy, creativity, connection, being known in a good way not being known and found out in a bad way, but being known in a good way. So that's where we say vulnerability is beautiful. And nines, you are such easygoing people um, and you hold your personal relationships so closely 
that you can merge and forget yourself. Um, so shame shows up and says, you aren't important. You don't matter. Um, it's not okay to assert yourself. Um, the healing message for you is that your presence does matter. Um, your opinions matter. A mantra you could try is, my opinion is important and my presence is valued. Or, I am my own person and I am at peace with myself. And that might help because sometimes there won't be peace with everyone in the world. <laughs> you might be experiencing conflict with another relationship, but you are your own person and you can be at peace with yourself. And maybe that's enough for today. So again, when we combat shame's whispers by leaning into love and healing, we allow these unhelpful personality patterns and our defense mechanisms to fall away, which actually leads us to freedom and transformation. That was amazing. Thank you, Thank you. for that. That was really, yeah. really amazing. Everything you said, very rich. I think for people listening, go back and listen to your healing message again or different mantras or affirmations that you can say because it's very important that you put it out of your mouth and so your ears hear it mm -hmm. and so your body understands and resonates with it. There's, there's, there's an impact and an effect that it actually has on us because a lot of times our type structure even happens in our muscle memory and the way that we do things, the way that we say things, the words we say. And a lot of times we give ourselves these messages that are wounding ourselves, crazy mm. enough as it sounds. Mm -hmm. We're like, well, a lot of times it's not just everyone else wounding us. It's actually this internalized message that we've created and that we perpetuate and that we say over and over again to ourselves in different ways. It don't look this way, but it looks a different way. And so we really have to make sure that we are putting words out of our mouths. And it doesn't have to be to other people. It really should start with ourselves and being able to put out these healing messages to ourselves so that not only are we saying the words, but we're hearing the words and we're hearing them talk to ourselves and they're resonating in every cell in our bodies. So this is extremely important and this is extremely true for things that we need to be working on and doing. If you're talking about doing inner work and mm -hmm. going from shame and guilt to true empathy to moving to help to moving to the outer work of making sure that you're doing like really truly transformational outer work mm -hmm. we're talking anti-racism work we're talking about uh intersectionality work we're talking about all a landscape of different things we need to be working on in our lives but if we're not right at our base at our core when i was i don't know years ago this person showed me a tree they drew a tree i was at a conference and you know, trees look different, but depending on how long they grow and how long they last depends on how healthy the roots are. So what are the roots? And a lot of these things mm. that we're talking about are the roots. Are your mm. roots healthy? Are you mm. just doing things out of personality or ego, which is not the healthiest version of our roots? Yeah, they wanted to protect us when we were young, but it's not the healthiest version of us and we're not driving the car. So make sure your roots are healthy and you're healing them by doing some of the things that Elizabeth has mentioned at the very end of this podcast. Well, hurt people hurt people. Yes. And so if we, like you said, we internalize our own wounding message and we can re-wound ourselves by our self-talk and the things that we believe about ourselves, then we're walking around with these open wounds, right? These deep wounds. We're going to act defensively because yep. we're, we're hurt. So, and then we act defensively. We're not engaging in productive conversations in doing the outer work. We're just perpetuating these defensive cycles and perpetuating and upholding oppressive systems. Yeah. And so in order to, yes, absolutely engage in outer work, but in order for the outer work to work, like you said, what are your, what's the state of your roots? Um, spend some time doing some inner work. I think we all have a, a preference, I think. Sometimes inner work is easier for certain people and sometimes outer work is easier for certain people. And so I would just challenge you to think about, you know, your self-worth. Where do you get your self-worth? What are your wounding message? What is your healing message? What is your ego's defensive strategy? How do you develop shame resilience to that shame wounding message? And then how do you move from shame to guilt? And how do you move from guilt to being accountable? And what is your work to do? Maybe it's 
actually stepping outside, maybe you've been doing inner work for a while and stepping outside and, and being active in your community. Maybe you've been leading all of the things in your community and now it's time to take a look within. So I think based off of everyone's journey, everyone's going to be in a different place, but inner, inner work and outer work are symbiotic. Oh yeah. The outer work movement in the Enneagram space has been hit real hard lately. Like we've been going hard in the paint because we've seen a lot of people use Enneagram only for inner work. I'm sorry, that's not going to do it. That's not Mm -hmm. real transformation. That's not even transformation inside of yourself, really. Like that's not real deep inner work because it's going to call you to do more than just something for yourself. It is. And so I absolutely love this. I'm going to have to have you on in the future, no doubt about it, even though we have probably like a seven part um, (laughs) episodes going on. And because I think even talking around, like you said, walking around with open wounds, that is the thing we have. And I had to realize this this summer, as I do, as we do anti-racism work, we cannot be coming at people from these open wound places because all we're doing is creating more wounds and we're not really transforming and helping people and yeah. really transforming the hearts of people. So like we actually really have to do this healing work, like healing is so important. And I don't think we talk about it enough in spaces but healing is so important. If we're really going to do like this outer work that we want to do and really change society and really help people and really protect marginalized communities and help people flourish in all kinds, in all states, in all different ways, there's no way, no way we can do it if we're just coming from an open wound. We're not, we're not helping. We're not solving any issues. We're not helping. We're not transforming. You know, we're just out there like scratching other people, clawing other people, and they're mm-hmm. clawing us back, you mm-hmm. know? So this is so pivotal. I cannot push it enough how important uh, this truly, truly is to our work in the Enneagram space, period. Please give how people can contact and find you. Please do, because like this is important stuff. And Elizabeth is a beast at understanding the connection between the Enneagram space and this shame healing defense mechanism work. She is absolutely beast in this area and working through the issues of getting to be able to do anti-racism work. Please go ahead, Elizabeth. Yeah. So my website is not just com. So that's not just E-N-N-E-A coach. Appreciate the pun, please. Um, <laughs> Dot com. So not just any coach.com. I also have two different Instagrams. My personal Instagram is at Elis Worm, E-L-I-S-W-U-R-M. And I also have an Instagram where I talk more about um, chronic illness and physical, mental, spiritual, emotional wellness, uh, because I have Crohn's disease, a bunch of other things. <laughs> and I'm interested in how chronic illness intersects with the Enneagram. So if you want to follow follow my wellness journey, that's also where I post a lot of Enneagram content that is at survival underscore thrival, because some days I'm just surviving and other days I'm thriving. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I'd love to hear from anybody interested in in talking about Brene Brown's work and talking about theater um, and the Enneagram, talking about chronic illness in the Enneagram, anti-racism in the Enneagram. That's my jam. Yes. I can't say enough. I'm going to go ahead and end the episode because I will keep talking about how amazing Elizabeth is and the work that she does. It's rare, I would say, sometimes to find people who are doing the deep work and the deep discovery and exploration of the Enneagram. Um, Right now, with the proliferation of things going on in the Enneagram space, but to see people who are doing the deep work like you are, I love it. It warms my heart because I know that There are people getting Enneagram information, Enneagram experiences that are really transformational and changing lives. And so like that, I just want to honor you by saying that I'm I'm really thankful for the work that you do in this space. I absolutely love it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm a two and I don't know how to receive that, but thank you. (laughs) That's okay. That's why I sent it your way. (laughs) Um, And so, yeah, I'm wrapping it up. So, Not exactly sure when this episode is actually going to come out. It's going to be a couple of 
weeks from now. But I uh, I just want to let you know the Kaizen Complete Enneagram program is going very well. I have a, a nice, solid group, and there will be another session coming up. And so you'll have a chance to sign up for that. Uh, don't forget, I also have some a big surprise coming out in the Enneagram space, which may be something you could read, maybe coming out possibly. So I need people to get ready for that because it's going to be kind of spectacular and I'm going to have a launch for this thing you might be able to read in this Enneagram space. And uh, I think it's a little unique for compared to what's already out there. So I'm excited about it. I hope you're excited about it. And just remember... If you're feeling triggered or if you're feeling shamed, take a deep breath. Remember your healing message and do it for the gram. The Enneagram, of course. We'll see you on the next episode. Bye. Do it for the gram podcast editing and mixing is done by Saw and Sign. Information will be in the show notes.